Welcome, people, to the ACSC Essential 8 update for November 2023. Last year was a big update, so we decided we would put together some information around uh, what we need to do and what you need to do to make sure that you've got everything cranky along. So my name's Shane Westcott, Security Technology Evangelist with Ivanti, based in sunny Donnybrook in the northern, northern countryside of Melbourne. And I'm joined today by my good mate, Abdul Aziz. You want to intro yourself, Abdul? Yep. Good day, everyone. I'm Abdul, uh, working as a sales and solution engineer for Avanti now for a few years, based out of Canberra. Indeed, sunny Canberra, which is a lovely place. Right, so our job today, based on our experience, we've both been working on the security elements of Ivanti for a long, long time and very much specialising in the Essential 8. Uh, my background, I've been with Avanti for just over 20 years. I've been spending all that time working with our app control solution, originally called AppSense Application Manager, now called Ivanti Application Control for quite a few years. Working with that, and uh, certainly since 2010, when the ASD Top 4 was released, we've been aligning ourselves to be able to assist our customers meet the requirements of those security frameworks, both the AST top four and then its uh, evolution, which was the ACSC Essential 8. So Abdul, a bit about your background? Uh, yeah, so obviously being based in Canberra, I've been in the FedGov space. So the ACSC E8 and previously AST top four have been something I've been working on a lot, uh, especially being a security specialist. My time with Avanti this time has been six years, I believe, so far. And previously, I had five years with AppSense. Yeah, there you go. So five and a six makes 11, if my arithmetic is okay. Right, so lots of experience for you guys. We've both been around for a long time, plenty of grey hairs to uh, to share around that. So after this, you've got any questions, feel free to reach out. We are very happy to engage and answer them. So a bit of an agenda. We're going to talk about the update uh, and Apps is going to go through the changes for AC restricting admins and MFA. Bit of multi-factor authentication. We just a reminder: we do cover seven of the essential eight. We don't do backups, right? So we won't be talking about backups today. And then I'll go through the changes around patch OS, patch third-party office macros, and user app hardening. Then we'll talk a little bit about how Ivanti can help. We've got a couple of customer success stories in there, and then we are open to your questions. So feel free to jump your questions in at the end. We are very happy to answer them. If you have any questions along the way and don't want to forget them, feel free to drop them in as well, right? Because we're very happy to answer them as we go along. We'll be there answering your questions during the presentation as well. So it should be good. Right, let's get kicking. Uh, why the changes? I suppose, you know, everyone knows that security changes all the time. The threats change over time and we need to make sure our responses are in line with the threats. And I think this is one of the things the ACSC has done a great job of doing that. They keep updated with things. They keep alerting people on different elements. And certainly with this update, we've got a quote there from the bottom around the update that the the uh, the key focus area is, is balancing patching timeframes and increasing the adoption of phishing resistant MFA. Uh, cloud services gets a bit of a gig there. And also there is a big focus in my view anyway, around internal policies and incident detection and response. Uh, now I've got SAN certification GCIH, which is General Incident Handler, which is a good fun course to do. It teaches you all the hackers tools and how they work and everything. But yeah, there's a big, big, focus on that training course around incident detection and response, having the right policy in place, having the right philosophy, uh, all about, you know, lessons learned down the end and all that sort of stuff. So it's something that these guys have jumped into the model, haven't they, Abs? Yeah, for sure. We'll see in a sec, the incident detection and response is probably the biggest change. Yeah, and I think, you know, previously it was very, very technical sort of stuff on the end point and very, very technical about what you had to do, but there wasn't anything about policy and incident handling. So uh, if you want to talk through this, Abs, just on uh, these sorts of things they've added in. Yeah, sure. So for almost all of the requirements, they've added these in for Mature Level 2 and 3. Uh, we thought we'd call them out here so we aren't just having the same thing over and over. Uh, so what they added was cybersecurity events that analyze timely manner, identify cyber uh, security incidents, 
And then a bit more around the reporting. Uh, so being reported to the CISO or one of the delegates, uh, you know, as soon as possible, and also reporting to the ASD as soon as possible as well. Uh, and then having the uh, incident response plan that you should have set up as part of your initial, you know, configuration to meet the uh, ACSC requirements, get that enacted and get that moving. So that's sort of been added basically across the board. I think with the exception of maybe two, uh, it's been added yeah. to basically all the requirements. Yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty yeah, much it's a big change. Board. Yeah, it's across the board, as you say. You know, they've got a real huge focus on that. And some of these elements, certainly things like um, – Analyzing things in a timely manner, we we can help with that. Our our logging and our ability to centralize logging and things like that for the incidents that are related to application control or privilege management is is really really good. But things like you know reporting lines and stuff like that, um, you'll see in the document that we're happy to share with people, which is all about Ivanti and the Essential Eight. We've updated that document to be in line with the November 2023. But you'll see with these particular elements on all of the ones they've been added to, we we sort of indicate that we can help a bit with number one, but the others are really internal policy thing. They're not much to do with an endpoint application control solution like ourselves. Right, so let's, let's start with app control. I'll let you uh, go through some bits and pieces around that apps and we'll talk about that. Yep. Thank you, yeah. So the true level one, not really a big change. The, there's been a rewording to one of the controls there, which effectively just added the compiled HTML and HTML applications, as well as control panel applets to the uh, organization approved set. Besides that, pretty much where it, where it was. So that's something that we can help you with uh, as well around the compiled HTML and HTML apps for sure, as well as the control panel apps uh, as well. Uh, Tree level two, it uh, aligns essentially with the previous level three. Uh, and it has uh, yeah, the new policy and incident handling requirements that we mentioned before. And uh, level three is basically the same also with the new handling requirements. Forgot to mention uh, the prevent execution of drivers to an approved set is not listed as part of ML2. That's the difference between ML2 and ML3. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. the, the big change that I'm seeing, I mean, We've already spoken about the policy and incident handling that goes in a lot of places. So they've added that in. But the change, I've had a couple of customers already ring me up about the ability to add in, you know, compiled HTML. Because I think previously level one, you basically had to block Xs and DLLs. It was pretty simple stuff, right? Which a lot yeah. of people were okay with. But once you get into some of these, yeah, maybe a little bit more involved controls, uh, they're not that involved for us. They're, there's stuff that's, you know, our bread and butter is out of the box. Uh, compiled HTMLs and all those sorts of things are stuff we, we're able to do very, very easily. But we've had I've had two customers come back to me just in the last, you know, few weeks about the fact that they were level one, now they're not, because they haven't yeah. added that in. So yeah, it's something that we'll see a lot of in the future, I oh, think. Oh, for sure. We'll be having a discussion with a customer coming up around the same thing as well, actually. Yeah, cool. Okay, let's talk about privilege management. Let's go through some of that. So Fair few changes this one actually. It's um, probably one of the ones that changed the most across the across the board. So with a true level one, we've got two uh, more requirements added there. So one was the first one was kind of implied, where the user has an assigned dedicated like priv account to mm. be used. Uh, that wasn't explicitly called out, but it was kind of covered off in a different one. So I guess it's just more reinforcing of what was already there in this in that regard. Yeah. And uh, the bottom one there. Uh, What's been added is around the access to online. So previously it was none. Now it's yeah. here are some rules around exceptions to what you can and can't do with online resources. As obviously more and more cloud resources are coming, uh, more privileged accounts may be going you know, over to the internet. So that's been sort of covered off here. Yeah, and I think a lot. Of, we both talk to organisations where you know sometimes you'll be doing a proof of concept, and they'll say, "Oh, we'll say you need an admin account to install it," but then there might be, you know, if you're doing security controls or something like that, that account needs to have internet access as well, and sometimes that's an issue because a lot yep. of customers do lock down their admin accounts to not have any internet access. Yeah, so it makes sense now to add that in, so, yep. so we can have some rules around that. So with ML two. What we've added in here is credentials for a break glass account. So I know a lot of people who would have had this in general 
uh, especially as you get more and more around your PAM solutions, having something like a break pass account is definitely going to be needed. So there's now some provisions written in there with that. Uh, so the event log controls are now align with uh, ML3. So what that is around the monitoring of them, as well as locking them down, which is something that we can definitely help you with. And then for ML3, uh, an interesting change, actually, Shane and I were talking about this just before, uh, a secure admin workstation. So effectively, you need a workstation just for your admin controls, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, memory integrity to be enabled and the LSA protection as well to be enabled. Now, uh, they've also broken out some of the event log monitoring from a single control into multiple controls to cover off uh, explicitly internet facing, non internet facing workstation as well as security events. And both ML2 and 3, as previously mentioned, have the new policy and incident handling requirements. Yeah, a lot of, I mean, the memory integrity one's interesting because not a lot of people know we have that built into AC. And we call it uh, image image hijack detection. So that's a built in element as a custom setting that you can put into your AC policy. I've got some customers using that. Uh, the security mm -hmm. admin workstation to me sounds a lot like a kiosk, right? You set up a kiosk machine which has only got access to particular applications with admin rights and can't do much else. Uh, so, yeah. and again, it's locked down so that only certain people can log on successfully and all that sort of stuff. But uh, it makes sense to do that, and I think that's a uh, that's a good way to go. So some good stuff in the, the privilege management space. Uh, multi-factor. Good old multi-factor, and apps will talk about this, and I'll say bugger all because I know nothing about MFA. <laughs> well, so once again, more changes here. Uh, with ML1, so... The call out now explicitly calls out, sorry, uh, sensitive and non-sensitive data and how they're handled separately. Previously, it was just data and, you know, what we do there. Now it's calling out both. Uh, and also the funnily worded control has been added, which was previously in ML2. Uh, I'll read it out because I kind of find it funny. Multi-factor authentication uses either something users have and something users know or something users have that is unlocked by something users know or are. So yes. what we're talking <laughs> is probably things like YubiKeys, uh, smart cards, that sort of stuff. Yeah, a very, a very, <laughs> uh, and a vague reference there to biometrics, you know, face or fingerprint, yeah. something like that. Exactly. I just think it's a fun word. So It is interesting the way they've worded that. So with ML2, uh, just like we had with the privilege management, the event log controls have now gone down a level to two as well. Uh, more controls added around online services and specifically customer data as well. So as opposed to non-sensitive and sensitive, customer data called out there as well. So like PPI, that sort of stuff. And as well, something that uh, Shane mentioned right at the start around um, the MFA systems being phishing resistant. So that is um, new, for yeah. sure, in that. Uh, that also applies to ML3, and, well, it got added into there as well, and then both, obviously, the incident and uh, policy the changes. new policy stuff, yes. Yes, yeah, so some interesting wording and in some of the things there for MFA. Right, let's switch over to good old patching, my favourite. So I'll uh, talk a little bit about these ones. Uh, patching OS and patching in general, you know, there's there's the statement at the front about aligning it more to things, and it's a little bit of the the Lord giver from the Lord taker for way here. And in, in fact, some things are are tighter, and some things are less tight, if that makes sense. So ML one here, we've added in not only uh, previously where it said an active exploit exists, we've also added in it has to be rated critical and or. So if you've just got something rated critical by the vendor, but it hasn't been exploited, still got to be patched within 48 hours. If it has been exploited, it has to be patched, patched by 48 hours, as it was uh, previously as well. Uh, ML2, we've gone from scanning from weekly to fortnightly. So the, the first one was, you know, it's, it's a bit tougher. But this one is a bit slacking off. So saying workstation and non-internet facing scans uh, have gone from weekly to fortnightly, and then the patching frequency for those same endpoints, workstation, non-internet, has gone from fortnightly to monthly. So, you know, trying to take a bit of load off for the general stuff, if it's just workstations and it's not internet facing, making sure that um, potentially there's a bit less 
work to do. In ML3, though, they've added in some extra things around specifically drivers and firmware vulnerabilities. So anything that's a driver or firmware vulnerability, again, rated critical or actively exploited, pardon me, needs to be uh, patched within 48 hours. And within one month, if it is non-critical drivers or firmware. So it's it's a bit, you know, we're stepping up some things for drivers and firmware. Uh, I know a lot of our customers will use our patch intelligence solution out of our neurons platform to very quickly give them a couple of clicks into what needs to be patched in 48 hours because you can select show me the things that have been exploited and show me the things that are critical really, really simply. And that mm -hmm. will then uh, align with that thing. Yeah. So okay. It's a big change with ML3. So, like, it's a so. bit of workload there with the firmware and drivers. It's you know it's going to be a bit more in, intensive, a bit more impact on the on what you're actually updating. Yeah, unfortunately, the firmware and drivers is from our patching solution point of view is something we don't typically cover, um, but we have capabilities inside of our neurons platform where we could automate the installation of the drivers or firmwares we could do that if you can run it from a script we could automate that and make it simple for people so uh, that's the sort of thing we can help out with there as well and we could potentially do that from our security controls patching solution as well because that can remotely run uh, powershell scripts and things like that so it depends on you know the element we might be able to help there and simplify that and automate it and schedule it just like we do for the rest of patching let's talk about third party patching so level one uh Again, we've put online services in here. They said at the start, there's a bit more focus on online services. That is very true of the third party applications side because the online services are called out across all three of the controls. And again, we've added this capability that, you know, it's not just actively exploited, it has to be rated critical as well. And again, we've changed the, the patching frequency. But what we've done here is interesting. With the general OS, we've actually slackened off, but with the third party, we've actually brought it in. Now, reason for that, and Abs and I always talk to people about this, we'll go to most customers, their OS patching is pretty good, but most people will be upfront and say, yeah, third party patching is pretty crap. Uh, unfortunately, if you get something that's critical or there's an exploit that exists, hackers know that. So if you get an exploit that's critical, or you can get an exploit and a critical vulnerability that is actually related to a third party patch. They'll be all over it like a rash because they know people are pretty slack with that, right? So it's something that they, that they do chase. So so we've actually brought that in. It's, it's more work, but it's more work where the focus needs to be. You know, third party patching is something that, you know, it's like the red-headed stepchild. It gets, it gets swept aside, but you've got to actually jump on it and fix it. And we've added on some, um, you know, as we go to ML2, we've added on some 48 hour there for online services and we've done that. Um, you know, we've added that across the board basically. So pretty simple stuff with third party patching. A couple of simple ones now, Office Macros, always been, you know, pretty tight anyway. Uh, interestingly enough, in ML2, they've removed the logging requirement. So I think it was pretty onerous on people to do that. You've got some checking for malicious code and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of things added with level three, but but nothing, nothing major in there. Uh, and then user app hardening, again, we've got uh, some fairly simple changes there. Uh, disable or remove Internet Explorer 11, that's just an upgrade from what we had there before, so that's pretty simple to do with our technology as well. Uh, hardening guides, the, the change here is that they've had hardening guides referenced before, but now they've made the call to say it must comply to the most restrictive, not just what's in there. Okay, so they've got to do that. And they've got some uh, things around PowerShell and you've got the new policy things, as we said, and uh, centralised event logs rather than individualised. So some bits and pieces in there. And ML3 is pretty much the same. So not a huge amount there for user app hardening, is there, apps? No, pretty static app hardening in macros generally. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty, pretty locked down for a while, I think. So, yeah, pretty static there. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, to finish off, just about where Ivanti does help. We're trying to keep this to uh, something that rolls along quite quickly so you get some value for it, but you've got a bit of time at the end for questions as well. Ivani, as you may or may not know, we're quite a large company, over a billion dollars of revenue, lots and lots of customers and lots and lots of partners. Uh, you know, patching-wise, we patch something like 60 million endpoints every month, something ridiculous like that. We're huge in those sort of areas. We do a lot around 
all aspects of the IT. Our neurons platform has been built from the ground up for CIOs and CISOs to include all of the elements they're going to need to focus on to drive organisations forward, get them, you know, working to the best of their functionality and ability for the everywhere workplace and just, you know, keep everything humming along to uh, make the most of the efficiencies that can be gained. So up the top is the endpoint and risk management stuff, all the security stuff where Abs and I spend most of our lives. Attend the bottom service and asset management. Yeah, a little bit of asset management and get involved with the service management stuff is generally done by other people on our team. So lots in there. We have a pretty broad security portfolio all the way from the left-hand side, which is uh, technology we acquired from our uh, mobile line acquisition end of 2020. Uh, the access pillar was from our Pulse Secure acquisition and again end of 2020 we've got the device side in there with our rbvm platform which we have as a cloud-based platform which is soon to be released and hosted locally as well which will be a big shift for our ivanti risk-based vulnerability management platform having that locally here will hopefully open it up to more and more people so that should be quite good all underpinned by our ivanti neurons cloud platform we take people on the journey, um, you know, whether they're essential eight. We do have some customers in New Zealand who love the uh, the Cert NZ Top 10, but we have just as many who stick to the essential eight because it's a bit more specific in the language it uses rather than the Cert NZ Top 10, which tends to be a bit fluffy. Don't know how to say fluffy with a New Zealand accent, but uh, anyway, it is what it is. So we take people on this journey and we can take them across to wherever they need to be. A couple of... Uh, Use cases here in customer success stories is a global logistics one. This is one of the ones I worked on. Uh, big organisation adding a whole separate organisation. They had highly complicated OT infrastructure, some of it up in AWS, some of it on-prem, and they wanted, you know, patching solution just around, you know, everything that they needed there. Uh, we helped them out, you know, our security controls went in, and did a great job, showed them how to use that across cloud platforms as well as on-prem platforms and everything was hunky-dory. Abs, you want to talk about this one? Yes, this is one I worked on uh, a couple of times, actually, at Queensland government. Uh, so fairly large organisation, about 10,000 devices they had. They were looking to align around app control uh, specifically. They were trying out some other stuff as well as at the time using um, – the Microsoft uh, inbuilt app locker. Yep. They found that was a bit too onerous and we came in, we helped them out. We got them to bring down their management and the cost of management for them and get them aligned with uh, with E8. I think we got them to, at the time, ML3. Um, not sure where we're at with them now. Probably should reach yep. out and have a chat. Yeah, should indeed. Now, it's good. That when we go and talk to a lot of our customers, we'll find that the way we do things really fits with the way they work. We like to do the discovery. Uh, the big the big thing is in the next key, what can we do? So it's, there's a lot of security solutions out here just flag and say, hey, something's wrong, you need to go and fix it. We actually flag things that are wrong, but we only do that in the context of things we can fix. So all of our solutions will do something that can fix the challenge we've just found. The CPR there stands for contextualize, prioritize, and remediate. So we are very, very good at that. We need to show people an outcome and visibility, which we do. We've been doing this for a very long time. App Control is in its 26th year. We had a 25-year birthday last year. Big party down in Melbourne was good fun. Uh, and we've got other things coming along. You know, our, our patching engines are 21 years old. We've got device control, which has been cranky along for a long time. And we had privilege management in our um, application control solution for 15 years now. So things are going along swimmingly and the solutions are continuing to add great value to the market. Customers diving on them over themselves, you know, year on year, which is really, really good. And, you know, if you've got something that's great, it just hangs around there. Okay. Yeah. It's over to our questions now. If we've got any questions, please put them in the chat. And we'll be happy to answer them and see where we can help. Thanks, Abs, for your time on that. Thank you. Yeah, and we will uh, we will now jump across and do all the questions that come in. Thank you.